for those who didn't bother to come in today. I left with a problem on uh, on um, Wednesday. I think it was this one. Very simple. 700 millimeters, 400 millimeters, and simple pin support there, and a force here of known magnitude, but not of known angle. Oh, six kilonewtons, not 100. Six kilonewtons. That really matters to the number. I'm not going to change the general result. All right, that was the, that was the setup, right? And hopefully you got a nice free body diagram, because that's what we do next. You know that our only available tools, sum of the forces and sum of the moments, and it's very difficult to sum the forces without a free body diagram. So stop trying. So we know that force, just don't know the angle. And uh, we know what kind of forces this support will supply. It's pin, so it doesn't do any moment, but it will do uh, lateral support. Uh, we got one up and one over, so we, we know we're going to have to counteract that, so we might as well draw them in that way. Uh, so we're looking for those. We're looking for those, and we're looking for that angle. Anybody do it? Kind, kind of did it? The angle was like 29. All right, well, well, let's see. So it's the usual thing. Let's see. Uh, well, we are going to need the X force. Um, we know, sort of know that. So we might as well start some of the forces. You don't have to do this in this order. And we don't always need to do those. But um, we clearly do here, so we might as well. So we know that AX equals 6 kilonewtons cosine alpha. Two unknowns, two equations, so we got to keep going. Uh, one equation, so we got to keep going. A y equals 6 kilonewtons sine alpha. Uh, three unknowns, two equations, so we still got to keep going. We can't stop until we have the same number of unknowns as equations. We don't know A components, we don't know alpha. So the only other thing we can do is sum the moments about some point. Any choices? Where are we limited by any choices? No, no. Uh, in fact, here's here's something that isn't always obvious. Uh, students pretty quickly gather that we can do it anywhere along the body, wherever is mathematically most expedient. But we don't want that thing to turn with respect to any point, anywhere which means we don't even have to pick a point on the body if we don't want to, if that's not what works out. If it's useful to pick that point, do so. We don't want it to turn about that point either, even if it's not on the body. However, in this case, that's not going to help any, because that's no different really than going here. So pick something. A, pin, pin A. Make sure that's down there so that you and I know. That takes these two out of the moment equation, makes things a little bit easier. So we either have to uh, figure the moment by getting the perpendicular distance to the line of action. That's kind of difficult, so we don't even know what alpha is. That would be something like that. That's going to be kind of hard. Or we could, what else could we do? 
Do what? Vector starts from A to Do actually do the cross product. R cross R cross of uh, six kilonewton vector, whatever it is. We could use this or anywhere else along that line as our R cross. We could do that. Or Yeah, just use the components. The thing is uh, that if you did the cross product, you'd get exactly the same equation that you're going to get by doing the components. So whichever one you prefer, most students are more than happy to skip a cross product if they can get away with it. But algebraically, you're going to get exactly this uh, anyway. So we'll replace that force with its two components. That gives us one counterclockwise moment and one clockwise moment, which makes sense. We know we're going to have to have two in the opposite directions and they got to cancel each other. So uh, we'll just write it down. We got six kilonewtons. Um, that's the sine alpha. So, oh, that's, that, that's good. The same term is appearing here. That can make things easier when we go to solve them. Um, times the moment arm, which is the 700, 700 MMs. Is that right? For the counterclockwise moment by the vertical component. And that's got to equal the clockwise moment. That way we don't have any minus signs. That's all we're doing here. Just taking the taking the low road, but it'll we'll get to lock one in a 40. Anybody want to sing that? No Irish. Trevor Lewis isn't Irish. I mean, oops, sorry, Trevor Smith. Wasn't Irish. Man, that was good. And and Smith McFisk. Where are you from? <laughs> uh, uh, what what? Don't forget the moment arm. Very easy to do because you've already got your brain wrapped around the components, you forget the moment arm, it's... That's the, that's the 400, because that's the vertical component. Um, oh! One unknown. One equation, one unknown. If we'd gone right to that equation, we could have gotten alpha right off the bat, and then we could have finished any of these. So, let's see. The, but, oh, the size of the force does not even matter in this solution. That's interesting, because that, that means we're heading towards a general case. Uh, uh, the M&Ms don't even matter. So, in any units, uh, you can work this out. You get then the angle equals, what you have there? 29.7 angle's got to equal about 29.7 degrees so we already got that good I mean, if we'd gone to there first we would have had that and now that just goes back into the other two and you finish them straight away now here's the general case that that leads to just redraw it. I don't care about the magnitude of the force that dropped right out of it there. Oh, it matters, of course, here, but it didn't matter for the angle. So, for the problem we have here with 700 and 400, and it doesn't even matter if they're millimeters, it could be anything, 700 and 400, we know that the force must be at 29.7 degrees. If we change these dimensions, it changes this and changes that. But for, for this one, that's got to be at 29.7 degrees. Now, I want you to figure out one other thing for me. Let's see how... Oh, let's... Let's do this. Uh, uh, yeah. When we do this, we get an AX is 5.2. So I want you to use these numbers now. And I'm going to draw them in a second. And AY is uh, uh, 
2.98. Oh, I'm going to move that a little bit just because I need it for my drawing. I need that space. So 2.98. Let me make sure I got those right. Okay. All right. Here's what I want you to do. Let's let's put those in here. This one's about twice as big as that one. So there's AX, and we know how big it is. There's AY, and we know how big it is. And that's really a single force. That we have one attachment. It's really only generating one force. We just break it into components because we need to do that to solve it. So here's the here's the force here. I want you to figure out real quick. I want to take a second that angle. I don't even do it on it. Figure it out there. Calculate it. Put the calculator. Put the calculator on it. So It's 29.7. Mr. Raptor is checking it for us. Oh, I'm not supposed to. Mr. Smith is checking it for us. Raptor McSmith. It's 29.7. Oh, my goodness. Oh my. So that means, well, let's see. Let's draw that angle. No matter what the force, Those two forces have got to be collinear. Force dropped out of it, the units dropped out of it, and in fact, if we change any of these dimensions, that would change this equation, that would change this answer, and that would change these. It would still be true for any dimensions, any force. So we have here a general case that is very, very useful to us because it can make some things much easier, if you remember it. It's optional if you remember it, just like it's optional if you even came today to find it out, everybody. And that general case is this. For any two-force member, whether it's uh, a standalone thing like that, or whether it's part of a greater piece, if there are only two forces on it. And that's what we've got. We've got F, and we've got the reaction force. We don't have, remember, remember how much these things weigh? Zero, unless told otherwise. If I put the weight in the problem, and the center of gravity would be somewhere about there. If I put the weight in the problem, this is not a two-force problem anymore. That's a third force. If it's a two-force problem, uh, notice if I had a not a pinned joint there, but I had a welded joint there, or it was embedded in a wall, then there would be a moment. That's a third force, a third load. For any two force member, the two forces must be, what was it? Collinear. So if you ever have a two force member in a problem, and be careful, it's very tempting sometimes to have one that looks like it should be a two-force member and would certainly make things easier, but it isn't a two-force member. So be careful. Make sure it's a two-force member. For any two-force member, the for forces whoops, must be must be collinear. That's the only way we're going to get equilibrium. Obviously, they're equal and opposite because that satisfies the forces right there. And if they're collinear, there's no moment possible. Satisfies the moment equation right there. It's got to be in equilibrium with that. 
So that can be very useful to us to uh, use two force members as we find them. Uh, they're not always so obvious. This one may not have been obvious until we did it, now we got it there. Most of our, we're going to be doing lots of uh, bridges that have some kind of load on them, you know, some trucks are driving on them or something. And if we take those truss members to be massless and pinned at each end, then those are all two force members, except for this one, which has a force at each end and a third force in the middle that's causing the load, the, the truck or whatever it is that's there. But all the others would be two force members. And that can make that problem a lot simpler because you already know the direction of every force in the diagram except the two forces right there because that involves a three force member. Uh, no matter what the shape, some kind of uh, link thing with a, some force on it, you know that those two forces must be collinear. Even if they're somewhere else, they don't have to be at the ends, they can be somewhere in the middle, they're still going to be collinear. And you can even, even just imagine that if, uh, if we had some piece and we were pulling on it in one direction and we need an equal and opposite force to get a force balance, you can tell just if you had that thing in your hands, if you pull on it like that, it's going to turn until the forces are collinear and equal and opposite. That's the, you couldn't pull on that piece and not have a turn. There's no way you could prevent it from doing so because uh, it's trying to seek equilibrium as, as any piece would as we pull on it. There'd be nothing to prevent it from doing that other than your hands, and then that's the third force. Okay, for any two force member. All right, so that's pretty useful. Keep that in mind when we need it. We can make an extension here. Oh, and if I make it before Mr. Rex gets back, then he's gonna have to watch the whole videotape to get it, won't he? So for any two force member, that's true. For any three force member. And by member, I mean anything whatsoever that we're talking about. I don't care. And that's everything you need to know about three force members then. Aha, you have to watch the whole tape. No, I just only got this far. We were hoping that it would take a lot longer. Next time, take a magazine. For any three force member, Anything that has three forces to it, which would be, for example, that thing we just had that had a force at each end and we took into account its weight. Or was welded at one end, so we had to take into account the moment. Or just had some third thing in here. For any three force member, the three forces must must have lines of action. Well, that's really what we were looking at here with these. The lines of action of those two forces are the same line. So well, again, we're looking at the lines of action. Must have lines of action that intersect. Okay, I guess that means they can't be parallel, but we are, we can be even more specific than that. Lines of action that intersect at a single point. S 
sometimes you can use that simple fact to take away some of the unknowns without, uh, without really doing any solving or calculation with the uh, equilibrium equation. Sometimes just the geometry will give you that point and now the directions are all determined. For example, uh, we've got our, our simplest of all members, just a single member with two forces acting at some place and some third force because that, that's a two force member and we know that can't happen as drawn. So we're talking about three force members, so a third force, and I'll just put somebody standing on a floor here. And so that's pushing the floor down, the rest of the building's pulling it back up, that kind of thing. Uh, these forces must intersect in a single point. Why is that? Easy to say, but most of you are going, wait a second here. Ah, prove it, man. I'm, but I jumped you and I'm saying you prove it. Yeah, that's that's how we do it. That's what line of action means. But how do we know that they those lines of action must intersect at a single point? And notice, it doesn't have to be on the on the body itself. How do we know they must intersect at a single point? And you can imagine from the geometry, if I had two force members there, I'd know those angles. All I have to do is draw back to where they all intersect and I got a whole bunch of the problem done just like that. But how do I know they must intersect at a single point? What must the sum of the moments be? About what points? Any points, any points anywhere. We don't want this thing to turn. We don't want it to turn anywhere about its own self, but that also means it can't turn in relation to any other point anywhere either. For example, that point, let's call it uh, D. Some of the moments about D must be zero. There's only one way that can happen, and that's if all three forces go through that point. So there must be some point where all the forces, all the moments sum to zero, otherwise we just plain and simply could never come up with, with uh, equilibrium. You know, draw, draw the equivalent, uh, I'll, I'll flatten one out just for illustration. Now, if, if uh, we do the line of action for those two, we know the moment's zero about that point for those two, but this one's going to cause a moment. So if I intersect these two, now those two make no moment, but that one does. There's nothing I can do other than this to get the moments to settle down and sum to zero for me. So that can be very useful. On that, that bridge one I just drew, if we have that situation where this is a three force member, but all the ones attached to it are two force members. That means we know the direction of the forces along all of these pieces, so we already know what they contribute, and now we can back into that one piece alone and know that all the forces must uh, sum to zero about a single point. And it's got to line that line because it's got to intersect that force as well. And so that can help us speed things up. So let's do a problem with exactly that kind of thing to it. Wait, where there it is. There it is. Okay, so uh, maybe you need to support 
a sign of some kind. So this is four feet. And you you decide in your engineering wisdom to support it like this. Because you want a little bit of flexibility, maybe kids will climb on it or something. You don't want to, so you, you want it to have a little bit of flexibility. So you build it like this. That's point A, B, point C, just for labeling purposes. You don't like thinking in anything other than multiples of 15 degrees, so you do that with it. And uh, one other thing, the sign has painted on it the word, I don't know if it's words, the number and word, 100 pounds in lead-based paint, which itself weighs a hundred pounds. That's how much paint in that. So, so the sign has weight to it, a hundred pounds. It's that big. Find the forces at B and C because we're we're going to pin these. We got to put a rivet through there. We want to make sure the rivet can hold those forces. So find the forces B and C. And you suspect from what I just talked about that there's a two-force member in the problem or there's a three-force member in the problem. Because I just talked about those. So you can use that to your advantage. Because you're sharp, you're perceptive, you're on the ball. You're like the Sherlock Holmes of engineering. You're always looking for those clues. What? It's a clearly run stupid fountain question that we couldn't figure out. Oh, really? No, see, <laughs> and, and what does what does Holmes do? And do this with your students. You just go, it's elementary. Oh, I can totally say that. Yeah, and then walk away. And then an <laughs> Yeah, because Watson never says, wait a second, bullshit. <laughs> Get back here. Watson just goes, oh yeah, boy, I was stupid. I don't know if the new one, that was on last night, I didn't watch it yet. So. Don't spoil it for me. It's a good movie. It's good? Yeah. No, not the movie, the, the series, oh. Elementary, with Lucy Liu as Dr. Walt Watson. That right there is good enough reason to watch it, <laughs> fellas. All right, do this problem. Figure out the forces at B and C so we can make sure the rivets can withstand that kind of force. And your suspicion is, I would guess, that there's a uh, two or a three force problem, uh, member in the problem. So, place to start as usual is we're looking for the two forces B and C. So let's do a free body diagram. So that's the place to start. So do a free bo force, free body diagram of the. Uh, uh, of the sign since that's what we're trying to get into equilibrium. Of course the link has to be two, but uh, we're worried about the sign. We don't want to fall out on these poor kids who shouldn't have been climbing on it in the first place. So a free body diagram. Let's see. Uh, yeah. See, the trouble is we have those two forces, B and C, <laughs> and that's four unknowns. Magnitude and direction of two forces is four unknowns. So we got to come up with something, something to help us here without having to call Watson. I mean, Holmes. We are Watson. I'm Holmes. You're Watson. So I'm about ready to say it's elementary, my dear Watsons, and leave. Start my weekend early. <laughs> what? Watson. Watson. No, Watson's is Watsoni. I like Watsoni. That's pretty good. Like Illuminati. Okay. The Illuminati. Those people who are 
members of the Alama, it, I forget what it's in, Alamanatus, didn't read, uh, what was that, uh, Da Vinci Code. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, get back to work, would you please? I don't have anything to do. That's why I'm messing around. I don't know what your excuse is. You were given a job to do. So get to it. All right, so we're trying to find out those two forces on that sign B and C. We're struggling with the fact that there's four unknowns. Two forces is four unknowns. Magnitude and direction, if that's how you want to look at it, or the two orthogonal components for each. Still, either way, it's four unknowns. On your iPhone, on the eBay app, see if there's any extra equations available for sale. Nope, there aren't. So you go to Craigslist. Is there anybody that's willing to buy an unknown so you can get rid of one, sell it to them? You can sell anything on Craigslist. Equations. Not enough uh, equations, too many unknowns. Buy some equations. And I'll put there, I'm a professor, they must be good ones. Alright, how you doing? Yeah, four unknowns. Sucks, doesn't it? this way. 
maybe those should be the other way, I don't know, but I do know those should be equal and opposite because it's the reaction forces of each other. So I might as well draw them like that. And BY has got to do that. And then I need an AX and an AY to counter those. So I've got AY and AX there. So that stinks too, because that's also got four unknowns. So what do I do? See the terrible dilemma we're in here? And we gotta hurry, because the hour of our show, Holmes and Watson, is almost over. We have to solve the mystery before the show is over. And people change channels. What do we do? We've got, we've got four unknowns there. We've got four unknowns here, two more that weren't unknown over there. We have six total unknowns. No, uh, yeah, six total unknowns. What do we do? What's this look suspiciously like? Two force. Two force member. Therefore, what? Yeah, therefore we know that the two forces must pass through the two points. I don't care what the shape of the thing is, I just care about those two points. I know the two forces must pass through there. So I know A must do that. And I know that angle. It's got to be 45 degrees. So that's one unknown that's not unknown anymore, at least not for this one. And what about B back here? What must it take out the components, put in the force? I don't want three forces there. Uh, do I know anything about the angle on B? Yes, it's also got to be 45 degrees, otherwise this is not a legitimate two-force member, which it most certainly is. So, if I know that BX and BY are of equal magnitude, which I know now because it's 45 degrees, right? Then, I know BX and BY are of equal magnitude. I have now I only have now three unknowns. I don't know how big B is. I don't know how big CX and CY are. I only have three unknowns. Uh, what else is true? Anything else true? Just to make it even simpler since we're cooking with gas now? Anything else I can do before I even start solving anything? I'm going to start writing the equations, but can I make it even simpler? Because if I can get this down to one less unknown, I only have two equations to solve. Right now I have three to solve because i got three unknowns. i got three equations, no big deal, but can I make it even simpler? You can find uh, where B, W, and C all intersect on their lines of action. Why, why, why do they all intersect? Because there's three forces. This is a three-force member. One force at this corner. One, these are not two forces, really. That's one force we've broken into two components. One force at B, one force at C, and W. They must intersect. And that tells me what about CX and CY? Yeah, I By symmetry, this must be a 45 degree angle here too, because that's in the center, and this is 45 degrees. So by symmetry, I know that this angle now is 45 degrees. I just, with a simple drawing, got rid of one of the unknowns. That makes the solution easier. And I know that C, X, and C, Y 
are equal as well, because I already know the angle there, because it's a three-fourths member. And so now you can solve it. It's, uh, it's just a matter of going through the pieces. Um, in fact, you just need to do the vertical components. You know that the two vertical components, BY and CY, must together equal 100 pounds. And so you don't even need to do sum of the forces in the x direction. Wouldn't help much anyway. All it tells you is BX equals BY. I'm oh, no, sorry. Bx equals Cx. That's all the x. So sum the forces in the y direction, and you're all done. And we do it, gang. So what do I have? B and C. B equals C by symmetry. And when you solve them in the uh, at y direction. Each one seventy point seven pounds. Because each component's got to be fifty. And you're all done. Um, careful. It's very often in drawings that because the drawing isn't perfect, and none of them are, because the drawing isn't perfect, you might see this point somewhere where it isn't really, just because your drawing put it there. So be very, very careful about where you put these points. If it's just the drawing that's telling you it's somewhere because you made it a 45 degree angle when there wasn't really one there or something like that. So be careful with this. Make sure geometrically you really do know where that point is and then you can solve for it. All right, watch for those two and three force members. We're gonna see them all through the term. And they're very, very useful, as you can see. All right, aren't you glad you came back, Mr. Rex? Yeah, that was worth, that was worth uh, leaving early. All right. Another type of problem, let's see. We'll get to these more in dynamics problems, uh, in dynamics if we do that in the spring. A little bit later in the term, I ask you what you want for the spring class, whether you want dynamics or thermodynamics or something else entirely. All right, got a couple pulleys. Got a couple pulleys attached by ropes, of course. And let's see, and I've got a, another, all these pulleys are the same size. I'm trying to carefully draw them, let's see, because I got a rope that goes over this pulley, down to that pulley. And I'm drawing them kind of loose, just so you can see where the lines go, otherwise these are kind of hard to see. And then I have another cord, I'll draw it in blue, that goes down around that pulley, up around that pulley, and down. And we're going to use that to lift a big mass. All right, just for, for reference sake, we're going to label these. That's A. So this will be pulley B. C and D, and the masses of all are the same, all the pulleys. And so we'll just make that an M, no subscript needed for those, but we're trying to find, well what we want to find is the tension in the line as a function of whatever mass we're raising. So if we need to raise a certain mass, we know how hard we're going to have to pull. If we can only pull so hard, we'll know how much mass we could 
find a lift. So we want T, the tension in the line, as a function of that mass. So uh, that means we're essentially taking MA as known, even though we don't have a value for it. Uh, it'll be in the equation as a variable, and we'll take it to be known because we can just plug something in when we're ready to do this. Or maybe we want to just buy enough uh, blue rope, uh, stout enough blue rope so it doesn't break. Okay. So, uh, want to find T. Let's, let's do this. Let's start where T is and just keep working until we find it. T is here, so we might as well work there. Let's do pulley C. Any forces on pulley C? Well, it weighs something. Uh, its weight is uh, uh, mg. Remember, m is the weight, uh, the mass of any of the pulleys. So that's its weight. I don't want to draw a free body diagram with masses. I want a free body diagram with forces. Any other forces? Yeah. Well, this rope's pulling on it. And what about the rope over here? Uh, I'm a little, little bit sloppy with the drawing. Let's take this to be essentially vertical there. The pulleys are a little closer together than I actually drew. Let's not take it to be any angle there. That just makes it a little simpler. Uh, what kind of forces do ropes exert? Pull in their own direction. So there's one rope over there, there's one rope over there, and they're only pulling because that's the direction they're going. That thing doesn't look like it's in equilibrium yet. So, uh, oh, it's got this rope here pulling up. And we don't know that amount. We weren't asked for it either, but just by inspection, we know that to be 2T plus mg. So, uh, hasn't helped this much. Still don't know what T is, so what do you do? Keep going. You can go to this pulley because we got T there. We can go up to this pulley because that's where the, the connecting rope went, and we know it has a, some function of T. So there's your weekend activity to keep try to try to keep you out of jail this weekend. Okay. Any questions?